Daniel training for Tyro. 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 He's got a big fight on Tyro, right? That's Nini's trainer. Nini's trainer. You know, his dream is to be a champion, his dream is to go back to Muay Thai. And he will not accept anything less. He doesn't accept that this is going to be a problem. Because he said to me, Mum, I'll get in there with one arm. I prefer two. But I'll get back in the ring with one arm if I have to. And that's the kind of kid he is, you know. He's just, he's just so strong in his brain, in his mind. And, and he's just amazing. He's been amazing through all this. Uh, Daniel was born on 27th of September 1990 in Sydney. Um, it was a difficult birth, took 36 hours, didn't want to come at all. Uh, when he arrived he, was, uh, he had some difficulties with breathing and things like that so a whole squad of nurses and doctors came around to clear him uh, and his airways and all the rest of it. And he let out a little cry and I didn't see him for two days. He slept for about two days, the first two days. And from there he was a really placid, a great little boy. He was easygoing, he was playful, he was funny. And he grew up to be quite intelligent um, and very successful in many things that he did effortlessly. That's, that's the thing I can say about Daniel. Everything he has always done has been effortless. He had high academics. Um, he taught himself to play chess when he was six and he won, he came third in the Gold Coast chess competition when he was eight. So he was very talented, very gifted, very intelligent, uh, very easygoing, always lived to the, for the moment, he still does, he's very much in the moment. When he was 16 he came home and he was really excited and a friend of his, Hamish, had shown him uh, a Muay Thai fight on YouTube. So he came home and he took us to the computer and he said, Mum, Dad, look, this is what I'm going to be a champion at. And when he said that, I knew that, yes, it would be because everything's so effortless. He would, if he puts his heart to it, it's done. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve uh, Zendukai, um, he was always into karate from a young age, 15, black belt. He was quite excited that Daniel took on this, this new challenge. So they took him down to John Wayne Parr's gym on recommendation of a friend, Cameron Quinn. 
and his journey started from there and a year, a few months into it, probably not quite a year, normal bond uh, was there. He'd been brought to Australia by John Wayne Parr to help train and he found Daniel and he approached us and he said, if you give me Daniel for two years, I will give you a champion because he has it in him. So Daniel and Steve set off to Thailand and they went to Ubon Ratchitani, northeast of Bangkok. Uh, very, very Thai. Uh, prior to that, I should mention three months prior to that, Daniel started teaching himself to read and write Thai through the Thai language. Uh, learn Thai, learn Thai the easy way. And he started to adapt the language and read into the culture and things. He really was involved. It makes it look like such an art. It's such a talent, you know, it's like, it's easy. He's not in there and he doesn't go like street fighting or anything like that. He knows what he's doing. It's like a, it's like when he plays chess, you know, you have those move, movements ahead. He's like that in Muay Thai, that's how I see it. I mean, he's had 35 fights, 25 wins, 12 with KO. So he's got a good standing record. He's uh, ranked third in the kickboxing um, magazine in Australian book kickboxing magazine he, he ranks third so he's got a lot of potential he's a promising champion he said I'm going to be a champion and I know he meant it I'm Daniel Kettler fighter from Tiger Muay Thai and today we're going to do a bit of fighter bag work conditioning um, what we do as opposed to a lot of bag work conditioning where people do three minute rounds and they just go in throwing their techniques is basically we don't step away from the bag. Um, we do a 20 minute round, just one 20 minute round. And just whenever you need to take a breather and get real tired, just walk around in a circle, maybe grab a quick drink and then go straight back to it. Um, the main idea of this is instead of like taking a break and moving away from the bag when it swings towards you, is you want to stay on the bag and just keep going things. If it swings back towards you, instead of moving back or out of the way, you just push it back and throw something up. So, I'll give you guys a demonstration now. June 8th, um, 8 o'clock, I get a phone call from a friend who tells me that Daniel was involved in a serious motorcycle accident and he was seriously, um, he was in a serious condition in hospital. And that is a phone call no parent ever wants to get. And I, I don't think anything can prepare you for, for the way you see someone when they're in that situation, especially when it's your son. Um, his face totally disfigured. I thought he had a lot of congealed blood in his mouth and I thought that he was actually swallowing his tongue because I couldn't see his tongue. And then I noticed he had missing teeth and his jaw, his jaw, his mouth was wide open and his jaw was over to one side of his face. His eye had been patched up so I really couldn't see the extent of the damage to the eye. And he couldn't speak, he wasn't conscious or anything. He has no um, trauma to the brain, but he does have um, a, a crash, crushed eye socket. It's been shattered. He said his jaw's been broken um, in several places. And then he said to me that he has an air bubble in the, in the brain and they had to clamp his mouth together, um, fix his jaw and his teeth together. Uh, he was in excruciating pain from the moment he woke up. His first words when he saw us was, Dad, I didn't crash. When I saw him laying there and he was just bruised up, his hand was blown up like a rubber glove balloon and it was bruised 
all under there here. His left hand was all bruised. You know, I was wondering, you know, how, where did he have this motorcycle accident? There's no road scratches on him or anything. And then some friends came, different groups of people came and they said, you know, this could have been, this could have been a bashing. This looks more like it's a bashing. And when we finally got him home from the hospital, it turned out he didn't have a fractured collarbone or a fractured forearm or a fractured wrist, but he had two fractured vertebrae in C6 and 7. They've now found a bronchial plexus uh, problem, which is a tearing away of the nerve from the spine, and C6, C7 and T1. His arm hasn't been moving. His, his arm's basically paralysed, if we have to say it in that way. There's no movement sensation to heat, to temperature. There's just lots of pain. He's in constant pain with his arm. Since we brought him home from the hospital, he's been 24 hours care. Oh, sorry, babe. Okay. Huh? Hold on, let me see you there. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Daniel's current situation, all I know is that he's got a brachial plexus avulsion of the nerve. Um, it doesn't look promising. He's lost about eight kilos since in three weeks. So he's very thin, uh, a lot of muscle wastage. Um, he was uh, very badly anemic. They found that he was um, severe anemia. He's got a problem with his jaw because it's not locked in. He's constantly feeling like it's moving out of place. His right eye at the moment, um, the doctors don't know whether it was the, the droopiness, whether it's consistent with a syndrome that develops after the, um, I can't remember the name of the syndrome, Brown Sequoia syndrome, I think it is, which develops after a trauma like that to the ruptured nerve or the torn nerve and that allows the, the eye to droop or whether it's just because of the actual surgery that he's received in that area and it needs time to heal. He sees blurry through it. Um, it's slow in motion with the other eye, so the optometrist is worried about, uh, she was worried about double vision developing in that eye. But our main concern outside of all this really is the arm because avulsion is at the top level of nerve damage because so, I look at that arm and uh, you know, I try to stay positive, but, you know, he just calls it a piece of dead meat, which it is at the moment. And then I see him fight, you know, I go every day and I watch his fights on YouTube and I make him watch them because I want him to build that confidence, which he has. Um, but, yeah, that's like a paralysed arm. And, and then I think about the outcome of it, like how, how he will be hindered in life. I mean, I know people have no legs and no arms and that, but when you've had an arm for 22 years and then your good arm, it's like having to really teach yourself everything, using it, you know, using your left hand and just dragging this dead weight around. I just don't want to even accept that, you know. I just want the best possible care for him, the best, whatever they can do. I'm, I'm confident that they can get it back, you know, to, to I'm hoping 100%, but if not, I'm happy with any movement, anything that can give him a normal, you know, normal life back.